One way to help the environment is to plant native vegetation. When choosing species for your yard or garden, choose carefully. Your decision can have a major impact on the ecosystem. Chris Berg of the Nature Conservancy explains the fundamental differences in types of vegetation. Well, when people talk about the difference between native plants and exotic plants, I think that it's, it's really important to, to get your terms straight. Native plants are obviously species that have been found here naturally. They were not introduced by people. And exotic plants um, typically are species, or always are species that are from another area of the globe. Uh, the difference between an exotic plant and an invasive exotic plant is that the invasive exotics have proven themselves to be capable of, of uh, seeding into uh, natural areas and overtaking natural areas. Uh, some examples of those are Brazilian peppers and Australian pines. And as the names imply, they're not from South Florida, they're from Brazil, Australia, wherever they may be from. And in their own native habitat, they're an important and healthy part of the natural ecosystem. Having been introduced into South Florida, where they have no predators and uh, they really are out of balance with the ecosystem, they can very easily uh, take over and displace native species. And when you lose your native plant species, you can then also have negative impacts on native wildlife. This is the seven-year apple, and it's a very salt-tolerant plant common along the backsides of dunes and uh, coastal berms throughout the Keys. This one will grow in uh, most any yard if you care for it properly, but it's particularly adapted to salty conditions and does well uh, along canals or along natural shorelines. It's got a very attractive uh, flower with a, a nice, not super strong, but a nice odor. Over here behind us, we can see the fruits of this seven-year apple. They don't really bloom every seven years or fruit every seven years as the name suggests, but they do have one of the largest native fruits in the Keys. A lot of our native plants are, are good for attracting butterflies in the Florida Keys, uh, basically because Florida Keys has 67% of Florida's butterfly representative species and 10% of North America's species. So when you do landscape to attract wanted wildlife, you know, butterflies, uh, you have a chance of, of putting a wildlife refuge in your yard. Uh, also, uh, by planting uh, native uh, plants to attract butterflies, uh, you kind of bridge the gap between uh, developed areas and natural areas and you could be responsible for a species uh, surviving. Uh, palm trees, two different types of palms. One on the left is uh, the common coconut palm, which most people are familiar with and a lot of people think is a native species, although it's not. It's not particularly invasive in any way, so it's not a, it's not a harmful exotic, but it's not native to the Florida Keys or even to anywhere in North or South America. Next to it, the shorter palm with the uh, kind of more wispy leaves is the cabbage palm or sable palm. This is Florida's state tree and this comparison really illustrates the difference uh, that the size and type of fruit makes for wildlife. There is not a single animal, native animal in the Keys that knows what to do with a, a coconut as big as a football. They can't get through the husk, they can't get through the hard shell. They would certainly like to because there's a lot of nutritious uh, meat inside. But those are basically useless for native wildlife. Both beautiful trees, uh, but one has a substantial benefit for wildlife. The other, uh, more of a benefit for people. While the human population in the Florida Keys is increasing, wildlife habitat is shrinking. Residential yards filled with native vegetation can reduce the stress on wildlife. Not only the wildlife that inhabits the Keys year round, but also those creatures just passing through. The Florida Keys are a really important migratory pathway for neotropical uh, birds, including songbirds like our warblers and uh, many of the other small songbirds, and also for raptors, uh, hawks and falcons and so forth. And those things, as they're traversing from North America to South America, most of the uh, eastern uh, individuals all the way up into Canada and the U.S come down and funnel down through the Keys, which are a very narrow 
uh, chain of islands and if there's nothing for them to eat along that chain they stand a much less of a chance of reaching Cuba and then the Caribbean islands and then ultimately Central or South America which is their next big source of food so if there's if there are no native plants and therefore uh, no native wildlife uh, along their path they uh, stand a diminished chance of, of making it. Helping wildlife to survive is reason alone to create native landscaping. But there are many more incentives for communities in Florida and especially in the Keys. One reason is the conservation of energy. Well, it's, it's very important uh, to keep in mind that native species have a variety of benefits other than just uh, for wildlife and other than just aesthetic benefits. Um, they can help you by providing shade, they can reduce the cooling costs of your house, they can, in, they can reduce your landscape maintenance costs over the long term by uh, reducing the needs for trimming and watering and fertilizing and so forth. And uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, they reduce the need for heavy watering. A lot of the exotic species, be they good or, or bad exotics, uh, are not adapted to the periodic seasonal drought that we have here in the Keys. And this is the gumbo limbo tree. Uh, it's usually referred to as a tourist tree because it looks like uh, sunburned tourist skin peeling here. But if you need a tree that uh, will give you a lot of shade and to cover your whole house, it's not that invasive on the uh, structures, but the gumbo limbo tree. By planting native species in your yard, you will not only save money, you'll save time. When planting exotics, prepare for a long uphill struggle to keep a species alive in an environment that is hostile and foreign to them. The uh, native species in general are hardier than uh, our exotics, not necessarily hardier than the invasive exotics, which are basically uh, bulletproof, but the, many of the exotics are not adapted to either hurricane uh, storm force winds or our droughts. This is wild coffee. Uh, this plant, although it's thriving out here in the sun, is also fairly shade tolerant. It's in the coffee family as the name implies and the berries that you see here are similar to coffee beans on the inside but you do not want to eat them. They're actually toxic. Fundamentally, natives are, are able to withstand our extreme of our climatic uh, experiences or in, environment where they can uh, respond from drought. They have a certain amount of drought tolerance. Uh, they have a certain amount of salt tolerance. Uh, they uh, actually respond well to flooding um, and you know the, all the host of all our environmental impacts or natural environmental impacts. Um, also, uh, use native ground covers instead of turf, uh, which is responsible for a lot of our uh, lawn maintenance chemicals. For the people who have waterfront properties and everything like that, who are constantly trying to landscape it, uh, native grasses, a lot of your marine grasses, especially your Spartina grasses, are great for seashore growth. Uh, they do several things here. Not only do they trap some of the sand and dust in the air with their leaves and then funnel it down to secure themselves, they actually will stabilize this land against erosion. The difference between a lawn of exotic grass and the planting of native grass is important when considering the health of our reef and marine ecosystems. The decision may seem small, but the power of one may make the difference for the future of our environment. The use of natives, uh, consequently, you, you're not applying a lot of, of dangerous chemicals that will percolate down through our porous limestone and eventually wind up in our nearshore areas. Uh, a lot of these chemicals, if you read the labels, will tell you that it is not to be used around water and no one lives more than two miles away from water anywhere in the Keys. Uh, also, 
the use of fertilizers. Uh, if you're not using a slow release fertilizer, once again, it gets washed out beyond the root zone where the plant can't utilize it anyway. And then it goes out into our near shore water area where you produce algae blooms and uh, just put more nutrient loading on our near shore areas. While many feel that fertilizers are essential for a healthy garden, there are alternatives to fertilizers that aren't harmful to our marine ecosystems. The main difference between us and the mainland is we don't have a lot of organic debris in our soil or we don't have uh, minerals. Uh, we have a lot of uh, salts and limestone derivatives. Um, so you could compost uh, to recycle plant nutrients. Uh, there, there's uh, a lot of uh, uh, different organic products like seaweed uh, will give you minerals uh, as long as you wash the salt out and uh, things like that. And, and compost is probably in mulch is the holy grail of landscaping down here. This is Jamaica caper. And this is, uh, in my view, one of the most attractive of the uh, Florida native trees or shrubs. It can be kept low and, and trimmed to be a shrub. You plant them in series and you can trim them just like any other shrub, uh, like any hedge. But it also can get quite large. I've seen them as, as tall as 30 or 40 feet in uh, the West Palm Beach area on some islands. Here you can see the flower of the Jamaica caper, uh, pretty white and purple color, very long uh, stamens. And again, the beautiful foliage, the dark green above with the uh, lighter uh, grayish silvery color below. These are actually some of the uh, shorter stamened Jamaica capers that I've seen. Some of these will get to be up as, as long as five inches. This is one of my favorites. It's the sea grape. And this is in the buckwheat family. Um, sea grape to my eye has one of the greatest foliages. It's a large plate shaped leaf. It's got a lot of uh, red in the veins, dark green above and paler below. Um, this is one of uh, several trees in the Keys that actually does provide us with a little bit of color. Uh, the leaves will turn red before they fall. Uh, not necessarily in the fall, but typically in the dry season. And then they'll come back right away. They don't, they don't stay bare for very long. Not considering the beautiful red leaves of the sea grape, detractors of indigenous landscaping often claim that exotics are more beautiful than natives. Although beauty is in the eye of the beholder, one need only behold the beautiful blues on the Lingham Vitae tree or join the vast populations of butterflies and hummingbirds that enjoy the bright red flowers of the flame bush. There is much support for those who wish to transform their yard into a Florida yard. It need not be a chore, but an adventure in learning about local nature in a way of reconnecting with our environment. Florida Yards and Neighborhoods, an extension service of the University of Florida, has programs throughout the state. Contact them at 305-292-4901 or visit their website at monroe.ifis.ufl.edu. Or get in touch with the Nature Conservancy and find out about their numerous educational outreach programs and their annual plant fair.